here and in between that time, we hope to um, have some uh, more advanced courses. So just be on the lookout for those notices too. I want to thank uh, Electronic Research Administration at UTHSC for all of their help in producing this series. Uh, your microphone to the left should be muted, so make sure during the course of this session, check it periodically to make sure that it either has a strike through or it's red. Um, if we have any kind of technical difficulties during this session, we'll terminate and then uh, the recording will be available online and we'll send out a notice for that. You will receive an evaluation by email uh, for these sessions. I think session one and session two evaluations went out yesterday. After completion, you'll have the ability to download your certificate of attendance. Um, yesterday, I heard from several people that that link for session two didn't work, but try copying and pasting it in your browser. If that still doesn't work, you can email me at mlynn at uthsc.edu and we'll try to work something out. Um, Dorita Brand and I, along with Risa Ramsey, who's providing support for nursing education, um, have no real or apparent financial disclosures. So today's session is good clinical practice, ICH guidelines, compliance, FDA regulations uh, by Dorita Brand. And she has been a registered nurse since 1986 and began her research career in 1990 as a nurse coordinator in the GYN department here at UTHSC. She has been in regulatory compliance and training positions for the last 10 years, assisting researchers in ensuring their adherence to regulations and guidance. She has a vast experience in different job positions and research for over the last 30 years and has been certified as a CCRC through ACRP for the last 24 years. Currently, like I said, she is program director for the Tennessee Clinical and Translational Science Institute at UDHSC. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dorita. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, hold on a minute, something's happening. Thank you. Um, as um, Margaret said, we have um, no conflicts of interest or financial um, conflicts of interest for our presentation today. So today, we're, um, our title is Good Clinical Practice, ICH Guidelines, Compliance, and FDA Regulations, but I'm really going to concentrate on the ICH um, GCP E6 um, Revision 2 um, guidance um, for today's lecture because we can't really um, in depth talk about all of the regulations and the guidances that we should follow when we're conducting um, clinical research. <clears throat> but here are some of the regulations, like you have the, um, the FDA um, Code of Federal Regulations, you have the Nuremberg Code, you have the um, Declaration of Helsinki, you have the Belmont Report, you have the Common Rule, um, you also have the ICH GCP E6. Um, R2. And so that, again, like I said, is going to be our concentration for today. So what are GCPs? Um, GCPs are a way of um, conducting research in a manner that helps us to demonstrate excellence, credibility, quality, standard um, dosation, um, in order to show protection of our subjects and to also ensure data integrity um, of our studies. Um, it's more than just rules on a paper. Um, it's our mindset. It's a way that we should all do research. It's my um, opinion that all research studies, no matter, please mute your microphone, that um, no matter what, um, research study you're conducting, whether it's a PI investigator initiated study, it's a pilot study, it's a sponsor study, I think we all should follow the ICH GCPs in order to show that we're compliant with good clinical practices. And that also shows consistency throughout all of our research um, that we participate in. And again, why do we need them? We want to if we follow GCPs, more than likely, we're gonna um, prevent misconduct. 
We're gonna protect our subjects. We're gonna assure quality, ensure the integrity of our data, and also it provides standards and guidance um, for us to follow and to ensure that we're doing things correctly. So uh, who is responsible for GCP compliance when you're on a study? Basically, the short answer is everyone that's associated with the study. Um, it, it's anywhere from your, your PIs, your sponsors, your CR, CROs, your IRB committee, your um, anybody that's a part of the study um, team, your medical monitors, your, your monitors from your CROs or your sponsors. And it's also, it also includes our subjects because they have to be compliant with the protocol and to follow the regimen of their investigational product or whatever procedures we're asking them to do. So it really encompasses everybody that touches that particular study. So what does being in compliance mean? It means that we must adhere to the regulations, whether they're federal, they're state, they're local, they're institutional. Maybe we have specific departmental um, SOPs or regulations, um, procedures that we need to follow. Um, also adhering to the ICHGCP E6, our IRB policies, and also the policies of the CRO, the sponsor, the protocol, things like that. And if we are in compliance, then hopefully on our study, we get a gold star and we are one of the number one sites for our particular study. And that's what we all want. We all want success, correct? So here is where you can um, find the um, E6 R2 um, guidance. You can find it at FDA.gov. Um, I suggest that everyone has a copy of this, either electronically or paper form that you can use as a resource or reference um, for things that pop up on your study. Um, in addition to if your um, study's under FDA um, purview, then you should have those um, FDA 21 CFRs also um, re readily available for you to look up for references and resources. Okay. So let's talk specifically about ICHGCP E6 R2. Um, this revision just came out like a year or so ago, and um, we've also heard that there's a revision three that's coming out um, probably sometime next year. So be on the lookout for that. So ICHGCP E6 is an international standard um, that a harmonization conference put together from several different um, sites across the world, and it's universally recognized um, as a critical requirement for us to use when we're conducting um, human research. And the reason is it wants to be an across the board quality check for how um, we conduct research and make sure that our data has integrity and that no matter if we're conducting a study in the United States, it can be sent overseas, um, Europe, wherever, and the company knows that it, it's consistent throughout the world of wherever it's been conducted. And then that helps also to be able to get, if we're looking at products as far as drug products, it helps, it's easier for them to get um, those products approved in different countries if they know that we follow the ICHGCP E6 um, guidance. So what's the purpose? I sort, of told, I, I sort of got ahead of myself a little bit and I told a little bit about it, but it's to harmonize procedures and, and standards, improve quality, hopefully by being able to um, use this across the world, it speeds time to market. If, if we know that we're all in compliance with this, it, it's less effort for the FDA or other um, world um, guidance um, people to be able to approve this drug or whatever. Um, and also it's used as a guidance for the FDA and the NIH. Um, pretty much all of your studies now, um, as if they're under FDA purview or they're under NIH funding, um, all your sponsored trials, I would venture to say 99.9% .9 if you read the protocol or your contract, it will say you will abide by the ICHGCP E6 R2. Also, um, it also talks about the Declaration of Helsinki also for you to abide by that. 
So there's 13, I'm not gonna go through all of them and read them for you, but there's 13 principles of the ICHDCPs. And just briefly, I've underlined just some of the highlights, ethical conduct, benefits justify risk, um, rights and safety of our subjects, um, that the information, our documentation supports the trial, detail protocol compliance, um, that you have to have IEC or IRB um, approval before you start the initiation of the study. And also you need a qualified physician. It doesn't have to be your PI, but it has to be a qualified physician that, that can um, provide medical care or make medical decisions if um, something should happen to some of your participants. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a medical doctor on the study, but that you have those resources to send those patients to whoever um, needs to provide that care. And then of course you'll have to document those kind of things um, afterwards. Also that each individual is qualified, um, that, and that each individual is talking about people, the um, study team members that are performing the task of the study. Um, and that's being qualified by education, training, or experience. That consent is freely given before, you, before a subject participates or does any of the procedures for the study. That you do accurate reporting, you have confidentiality of your records, that you conform to any G GMPs if that's part of your protocol. And that you have systems with procedures to ensure quality, which that's pretty much speaking to your SOPs or your MOPs, whichever one you may have um, for your particular study, your institution, your department, whatever the case may be. So let's talk about the sections of the ICH GCP E6 um, guidance. There are eight sections, and today we're really gonna focus on one section, the section four, as you can see what the other sections are um, talking about their topics. The section four is, a, is guidelines for the investigator. A lot of you on the line might be a coordinator, you might be a data manager, you might have other roles besides the investigator on your study. So we all fall under this investigator section, section four. Um, the other section we'll talk to you about briefly is section eight, which are your essential documents. And we have another um, presentation later on and maybe next week, I believe, um, that Carol Hendricks and myself will be presenting on essential documents and what you need to maintain and how you need to maintain them. Um, so today, section four, the investigator um, section is the one that we'll be um, discussing in detail. So before we get into this, what I would like to do, what I've done is on, my, on the um, slides, I've put on the left-hand slide what the ICHGCP says, and then on the right-hand side, I've put how to show documentation or compliance with that particular guideline. So when we get to that part, if you'll sort of scan the left-hand side, and I know those slides are busy, I apologize, but if you can scan the left-hand side and sort of see what that ICHGCP um, section is saying, and then we'll go to the discussion of how to show compliance. And I really would like to get feedback from the audience. If there's something that I have missed, something that needs to be added in your experience, um, or your knowledge, please let me know, and then we can, I can add those and um, send out some information to everyone in a document if um, you would like that. All right, so the first one, 4.1, talks about investigator qualifications and agreements. And that agreement is not really necessarily talking about specifically the contract, it's talking about agreements that you'll follow the protocol and you'll do the procedures as the, as the protocol um, addresses and says. And, and uh, the qualifications we've talked about, you have to be qualified. Anyone on your study has to be qualified by training or experience or knowledge. Okay, so let's get started. All right, so 4.1.1, 4.1.2, 3, 4, and 5 are on this. So sort of scan, I'm gonna give you just a couple seconds to scan what those the description of that guidance is saying, and then we'll take them one by one and see what kind of documentation or documents that we need to show compliance with that particular um, guideline. So read 4.1.1 first, please. Okay. 
Okay, so 4.1.1 is talking about being qualified by education training experience. How are you going to show that everyone on your study team is compliant with this regulation, with this guidance? Does anybody want to join in or you just want me to list them out and you tell me if you have anything additional or I'd like audience participation if possible, but anybody want to volunteer? I can't read it. You can't read it? Can y'all read it? Okay, so cred credentials, what, what to show um, qualified by education training experience, you, you need credentials. So you need the CV, the resume um, of anyone that is on the study. You need their current, especially for your PIs and your um, sub -I's. You need medical license or certifications or nursing license. You need training logs, documentation. You need protocol training documentations. You need any GCP or city training. All of those things show that that person, the study team member is on, um, that's on the study is qualified by education training or experience. 4.1.2 is talking about that the investigator should be thoroughly familiar with the investigational product if there is one. Um, and so I'll just go through it since some people might not can read it. Um, it's very big on my screen, so sorry. Um, on that, you need a training log, documentation for the protocol. You also need to show the investigational brochure or your drug insert or your device manual or your pharmacy manual and show that the investigator, the sub-investigators and anyone that's involved, whether it's maybe your um, investigational pharmacist, that they are very familiar with that investigational product and how it works. And anyone that's um, distributing the investigational product should also um, be familiar with the, um, the IP. 4.1.3 is that the investigator should be aware and should comply with GCPs. Um, again, training log, documentation, showing that the investigator <laughs> or you could just take on the date that they have read that particular document. There's also ways to document that they have access and they're aware of the information within those long, long, long documents. 4.1.4 .4 is the investigator institution should permit monitoring and auditing. So on that one, we, uh, we know if we have um, an outside um, monitor coming in that we should have a monitoring log. And we also um, should have a, a monitoring plan. Even if we have an investigator initiated study, that investigator takes on the responsibility of the sponsor. And so they should have some kind of a monitoring plan and a monitoring log to show when that study was monitored or audited. Um, of course, a PI initiated study is going to have a much less rigorous monitoring than one that's monitored by you know, the FDA or the um, a sponsor or CRO or um, things like that. And 4.1.5 talks about- Hey, Dorita. Yes. Um, we're all he hearing a lot of static on your end to where we can't understand what you're saying half the time. Okay, let me try something different then. How, is this better? So far, yes. Okay, sorry. 4.1.5, <clears throat> the investigator should maintain a list of appropriately qualified persons. Again, that, that goes back up to the credit, part of it is the credentials. Um, the other part is the delegation of authority log where you have everyone sign and their um, tasks are delegated by the PI, your CVs, your license, your credentials that we spoke about earlier. Can you hear me okay now?
Dorita, uh, yes. I, think, I think some people aren't muted. Maybe Kathy Horowitz, can you mute, please? Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right, 4.2 um, is adequate resources. And I'm gonna try to go a little bit faster since um, some of you are having some difficulty seeing and things. So 4.2.1 is talking about um, demonstrating the potential for recruitment. So on, for that, how do you document that or how do you show compliance is your study feasibility meeting or your questionnaires that you filled out for like sponsor trials. Um, anybody else have anything else that they um, complete to, um, show, to demonstrate this? You might do a retrospective, um, like looking at um, the number of patients you have for a certain um, type of um, disease process or something like that. 4.2.2, the investigators should have sufficient time to properly conduct and complete the trial. So again, your study feasibility meeting or questionnaire, documentation of current studies being conducted, and the PI uh, and the co-PIs assuring that they have the time to um, meet this responsibility. 4.2.3 is talking about available and adequate number, adequate number of qualified staff. That again um, is your study feasibility, your questionnaire, um, that they have appropriate time. They don't have like, you don't have one, say one coordinator that has 15 studies and that coordinator is going to do this one too. Sometimes sponsors will look at that. So you wanna make sure that um, whoever is conducting the study, as far as the study team member, that they have adequate um, time and resources to give to this new study that they're looking at. 4.2.4, the investigators should ensure that all persons assisting with the trial are adequately informed. So that's the training log. Um, the 4.2.5, the investigators responsible for supervising any individual. That's the training log, that's the declaration of, of um, the DOAL is also the documentation of oversight. And a lot of times this is a place that we really miss the boat on is the documentation of oversight. Our PI or our sub eyes might have oversight, but we don't show that. So make sure that you really document that oversight. Sometimes it's just them putting a signature on um, a source stock or on a site source stock that you've created. Um, or sign in behind you if you're doing progress notes, things like that, that shows oversight. Um, 4.2.6 is if the investigator institution retains the services of any individual or party to perform trial related duties, then basically the PI is responsible for that. And this came out in this revision, um, like for example, if we're using outside labs, then we have to show the credentials to certification um, of those particular level labs. Not, usually not if we're doing sponsored trials, but if we're doing PI initiated trials and we're using a certain lab to do um, a test for us, then we have to make sure that we have all of those credentials and certifications for the lab and most of the time for the lab director. So 4.3 is medical care trial subjects. We have to be able to have a qualified physician um, to be able to give the, that medical care or to refer to get the responsible medical care if something should go wrong. So there, that again is your delegation of authority, your inclusion and exclusion worksheet signed by the PI to make sure we are um, getting the right um, patient um, enrolled. Also PI oversight that we just talked about. 4.3.2 is during and following the subject's participation in a trial that we should ensure adequate medical care. If we need adequate medical care, then we probably have an AE or SAE. So we need to make sure that we have that log, it's documented, any reports of any tests or anything that went along with that, progress notes, medical records. And if it's an SAE, well, you, a lot of times AEs too, but for sure SAEs, we need to follow it all to resolution. Um, so those are some things to do for if a patient has some kind of adverse event. 4.3.3, it is recommended that the investigator inform the subject's primary physician um, about the subject's participation. This is something that we should do on the front end. Um, it recommends this if the subject agrees. Um, a lot of times what we would do is we will create a, a PCP letter. It has to be IRB approved 
And then if the subject agrees, then we send it to that PCP at, when that patient enrolls in the study. And that's really important for certain kinds of um, studies where maybe they have high blood pressure, they're on high blood pressure medicine, but then they're also seeing their P PCP at regular intervals. You want that PCP to know they're on an additional medication so there's not um, any kind of um, issue with the um, medicine if they go to change their medication and things like that. 4.3.4 is although the subject is obliged to give his or her reason for withdrawing prematurely, um, they don't have to, but we ask them to if possible. So you would contact them via phone or mail, document accordingly that you tried to see why they um, um, prematurely withdrew from the study or whatever, if possible. Um, sometimes it's, just, it's out of our control, we can't help it. I mean, they just can't come to their appointments anymore or you know they don't have um, the travel uh, capacity, things like that. And then sometimes it's just a misunderstanding and maybe you can you know, work that out and they misunderstood something and you tell them how it, the protocol really reads and then that you can get, they can come back into the study if they voluntarily do. Okay, 4.4 is about communication with the IRB. <clears throat> and so most of this is 4.4.1 is talking about before you initiate the trial, you should have the IRB approval. So on that, you're gonna have the outcome letters, you're gonna have the approved consent form, any kind of pro, um, proviso letters, your response to those proviso letters, anything that you submitted or received from the IRB, you're going to keep those. Um, and also that 4.2, also is talking about a current copy of the investigator brochure. So you, most of the time you um, submit that to the IRB and then you'll keep those necessary documents and show that the IRB acknowledged that they received it. 4.4.3 is during the trial, the investigator institution should provide the I, um, RB, IRB with all documents. And those are all your progress reports, your amendments, your deviations, as is required by your particular IRB. Because some IRBs, um, want all the deviations, some only want the ones that, you know, are um, essential or cause any um, major issues, or sometimes they want to trend in deviations before they're um, reported. So just go by what your particular IRB or IEC is requiring at that um, moment, because sometimes it, it does change. But you would keep reports of all the submissions um, and deviations on a deviation log, things like that. So compliance with the protocol is 4.5. And one of my means is can't follow the rules, no group for you. And that's really sort of how we should go because um, in research, we have to follow, we need to follow the rules. If we don't, bad things will happen. Um, we won't do the protocol correctly. We lose data. There's no data integrity. You know, patients can so have suffer um, issues, things like that. So 4.5.1 is the investigator um, institution should conduct the trial in compliance with the protocol. Um, so you have the sign 1572 if you're doing a sponsored trial that the PI signs that says that. You have the sign protocol page. You also have the clinical trial agreement for those um, sponsored trials. You also have um, source documentation on all trials. You, you should be following Alcoa C um, for all of our documentation and you should have appointment calendars. Um, if you're conducting FDA calls, it has been noted that FDA will come in and look at your appointment calendars to make sure that you actually were there and you actually did see patients. Um, 4.5.2 is the investigator should not implement any deviation until it's been IRB approved. Um, so if this does happen, you have deviation laws to fill out. For our um, UT IRB, it's a form four for revisions. Other IRBs will maybe label it in a different way. Um, so um, do not change. When you put a protocol into the um, IRB, you are to do that protocol exactly like the IRB has received it. If you make any deviations from it or any revisions, unless it's for the safety of the patient, you should wait till you get IRB approval to make those changes. Um, and the last two, 4.5.3 and 4, is 
<clears throat> if you do have a deviation or you implement one to, to eliminate hazard, like I said, for the patient, then you need a deviation log and you do need to um, report like some of those issues to the IRB also. Investigational products. I'm not going to go through all of these because you can go back and read the 4.6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. That's talking about investigational products, like who's responsible, um, who should assign um, duties for the investigational product accountability, um, the, the pharmacist, like who is who's receiving it, who's dispensing, things like that. Um, so basically you need an IP accountability log where you keep up with the receipt of the drug, the distribution of the drug, the storage, the destruction, and the return. Excuse me, Dirta. I'm yes. sorry, Dirta. I mean, your, your, your uh, shared screen, they cannot, I cannot read it very clearly. Others are like saying? I will have to just send these slides out because okay. it's a very full screen on my side. I don't know what's happening and I apologize. Um, but, and also like with who is responsible for the IP accountability, that should go on your, um, uh, train, your documentation of your training log and your delegation of authority. Also, um, you will have, you might have temperature logs for your IP accountability. Um, you also will have uh, possibly subject instruction documentation, sheets that you give to the subject. Those um, beforehand need to be um, approved by the IRB. Um, and also you might have source, you will have source documents or, or site source dots, what you create, like a progress note or whatever, showing the dispensing and the return of those drugs from your um, subjects. Randomization procedures and unblinding. Um, how is the, the unblinding, the randomization, how is this documented? Um, you, any th time you unblind, there's a protocol section that will tell you exactly what um, instructions to follow. And so um, if you need to unblind, you will document that process. You document the steps, the events, what happened with the patient and follow whatever's going on with the patient to unblind them until resolution. So informed consent of subject trials. I'm gonna briefly speak to this because Margaret is giving a host session on informed consent. Um, but basically you need um, to, to know what version of your informed consent you have. If you keep an um, ICF log, um, that's fine. Nowadays with a lot of the electronic IRBs, you don't have to do that. Um, but you wanna make sure that you keep the current version available for your study team to um, be able to access at any point. If you get a revision, you need to get um, take those um, old versions out so that the um, correct version is being utilized. And also, it's very important that we document the informed consent process. So a lot of our IRBs now are giving us like templates of how to document the IRB process. It's not just good enough for our subjects and, and whoever's obtaining consent and possibly our PIs to sign the informed consent you need um, to have documentation of that process. Um, and in our essential documents later on, we'll talk a little bit more about, give you an example of the informed consent process documentation form. Again, this is continuing. There's a lot of slides about the informed consent and the majority of them is your source documentation of um, the process and making sure that your informed consent document is signed and dated all correctly, that every um, page, if that's a requirement from your IRB, that it's initialed appropriately, that the appropriate people sign in their um, appropriate spots, the correct date, all the things that you all know um, needs to be uh, accomplished. Um, just one thing, um, I'm sure most of you are experienced, but just make sure, take the time on the informed consent process to
to go back and before that patient, that subject leaves, go back and look at every single page to make sure every single page is initial and make sure all of the dates are correct, that the signatures are in the right place that it needs to be, those kind of things, because that's a really big finding for a lot of studies when monitoring and auditing is um, conducted. <clears throat> Again, more 4.87 and 8 are about your ICF, so go back and review that, but how to document is the same for all of these. I'm going through these quickly because they're all about the informed consent and Margaret's going to talk to us a little bit more on that, but I didn't want to leave it out. 4.9 is the records and reports. We all know we have tons of records and tons of reports. So the first one, 4.9.1, talks about ensuring the accuracy, completeness, the um, timeliness, things like that. That's our Alcoa C. Um, let just recently, I guess maybe a year or so, they added the C, which is complete. You want to have source documentation on all your subjects. You want your case report forms completed appropriately. That's a good place. If, if you're doing paper case report forms, that's a good place to have your um, PI come back and sign those to show oversight. A lot of your electronic data management systems will have the um, PI come in and sign behind each um, section of a case report form too. That's a good way to show oversight that they know what's happening um, with that particular subject for that on that study. Um, also 4.9.2 is um, data reported on this um, case report form um, from source doc. You, you've got to have source documentation whether it's labs or it's progress notes or it's note to files that you've written. Um, we have to have a source of some kind for all of the documentation that we put in our case report forms. Um, any change or correction to the case report form should be dated initially and explained. Um, we all know that as far as um, the Alcoa C, all those kind of things need to make sure that everyone is aware of who actually completed the document that they're looking at. And then that 4.9.4, the investigator institu uh, institution should maintain the trial documents um, as specified in the section eight. So you get have a regulatory binder, make sure it's all up to date with your central docs, whether the regulatory binder, binder is electronic or it's paper, format. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a combination. We just have to maintain all of those essential documents. No one can really tell you like how to maintain documents. Like I said, whether it's electronic, whether it's paper or whatever, just so long as an auditor or a monitor comes in and they need to see something and you can produce it to them, that's all that they can ask for. Now, they might ask you if it's in electronic to print it off and put it in a regulatory binder at some point in time. But as long as you have it, they can't um, cite you for, for those kind of things, as long as you can produce it easily for them. All right, 4.9.5 is essential documents should be retained until at least two years after the last approval of marketing application. This is <clears throat> true. But most of the time, if we're doing a sponsor trial, then we need to know what the protocol and the contract language says. A lot of the sponsor trials coming out now are also following the European um, guidance, and they're asking us to keep those um, essential documents for 25 years. So make sure you know what your protocol and your contract says. Um, that will help you to know how long you need to keep these, especially for your sponsor trials. Um, track the location of your study files. Um, if you are doing a sponsor trial and you've told them in your 1572 where your documents are going to be maintained, but it's been, you're supposed to keep it for 25 years and it's five years down the road and you want to put it in a storage area, then you need to know who to contact to let them know that, that um, those essential documents are going to be stored in a different location. 
4.10 is progress reports. So the investigators should submit, submit written summaries of the trial status to the IRB annually. So those are, and also 4.10.2 is that you should um, provide the IRB any written reports when applicable if some conduct is going on. So just keep your IRB submissions um, reporting and submitting um, those reports to the sponsor and the CRO is applicable also. And then maintaining all of these reports in however manner you want to for your essential docs. So safety reporting is 4.11. And on this it's saying all serious adverse events should be reported immediately to the sponsor um, and your IRB. And that depends on your IRB. Um, so look at your IRB SOP because some IRBs, if it's already um, deemed an SAE in your protocol, then they don't want those reported, but you would still keep a log of those. Um, you also need to keep a concomitant medication log. You need diaries from, if that's part of your um, study, you keep up diaries to show all this information and any um, progress notes that you um, write about um, the adverse events or the SAEs. Um, also, if there's any laboratory abnormalities, you would have that on an AE or an SAE log. You wanna follow it to resolution. Your PI would probably note on the lab um, report if it's clinically significant or not clinically significant and sign and date. That again is a way for them to show oversight. If it's clinically significant, then something needs to be done, even if it's just follow up those labs in like a week or two or whatever, to show resolution um, for that particular um, lab value. And for reported deaths, that should be um, submitted to the sponsor and the IRB um, as soon as possible. And again, you would keep up with that on your SAE or AE log. And then if the study is prematurely suspended or terminated, um, basically the IRB needs to know um, and if the um, sponsor terminated the study, um, not for a reason of the subject, but just the overall study, then subjects need to be notified also. Um, if the um, sponsor has terminated the study or paused the study for a site because of infractions or things like that, the IRB needs to know immediately. Um, and, this, and if it affects the subjects where you can't continue doing their um, visits, things like that, then of course the subject would be notified. Um, and then the final report by the investigator um, we just have closeout forms submitted to the IRB. You'll have where the storage of the essential documents are um, and make sure again, the timeline, you know what you need to do. If you change the location, notify the um, sponsor. And then the ICHGCP section eight is the essential documents. And like I said, that is one that um, Carol and I are gonna um, provide in detail like in a couple of sessions from now. Um, where we talk about um, each essential document and um, hopefully give you some examples of some. This is just the essential document um, section. I'm not gonna go over it because you all have this um, available to you. So what can we do to help ensure compliance? Hopefully one thing is to be proactive, to attend training, to learn more about um, the ICHGCPs, know what they say, know what, they, what it means to be compliant, like some of the things that we've given examples of today. And you might have more additional examples of how you can show compliance. Um, participate um, in conferences and meetings and develop, um, if you don't have policies and procedures uh, or SOPs, develop those um, so that, that your study team knows how to um, conduct the study according to the ICHGCP E6. And summary is just the number one job that we all know for every training session we ever attend is to protect our subjects. That's the main thing. 
Um, the other thing is we want to make sure we have clean, accurate, and complete data. If we don't have that, then all of our time and effort, our, pay, our subject's time and effort is, to, is gone to waste because we might not can use that data for that study. Um, follow your regulations, get organized, keep up to date, make sure you follow the protocol, um, keep everyone um, up to date, whether that your PI, your IRB, your study team, your sponsor, it's best to tell people what's going on before an issue gets to the point that we do have a, a big deviation or um, things that it's not easily solved. Um, continuing education document to de demonstrate compliance and then report as required. And sometimes we don't do as good of a job reporting. Um, our IRB here at UT, for those of you that use our UT IRB, they're very user friendly. If you have a question, and I'm sure I've, I've dealt with other central IRBs too, and they're the same, call your IRB and ask them, is this something I need to report or is it something I just need to document? Um, and they're usually very helpful and very friendly. And so that way you know um, how they want things done at that particular time and document that conversation. So later on, you know, well, I might should have, um, reported this, but then you have the documentation that said no, just document it or whatever. So, all right, I've gone through this really quickly, and I'm sorry a couple of you did not could not see the as well the presentation. So these will this will be recorded. The slides will be um, on our website at a later date. I'm not sure how quickly we can get them on there, but it will be on there. And I appreciate um, everyone listening and hopefully it um, helps some to understand the ICHGCPs. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please do not hesitate to um, reach out to us and we um, can hopefully answer most of your questions.